16 million colors. Make some havoc in your head. Welcome to the first video production of TitanCast, your home for Sega Saturn news, commentary, personal stories, and more. I'm one of your hosts, Samuel, the Southern Sega Gentleman. With me today, we have Simon, our beloved Father K out of Manchester, and our resident Washingtonian, the virtual schlub, Brian. So everybody, uh, seeing how this is the very first video production of TitanCast, we're also going to have some video up on YouTube with this. But we figured that we'd go ahead and go over a little bit of news in the Facebook community as well as Sega Saturn community. First off, we'd like to go ahead and give a shout out to the Sega Saturn Shiro podcast guys. K, uh, what's the rest of their names? Patrick and David. Yeah, they um they gave us a shout out on one of their last podcasts whenever they were going over the news cycle. And, you know, real big props to that, man. Uh, we're an up and coming group and they, they've got a pretty firm base already. So we really appreciate that, man. Um, another thing is, is that the guys over there, they, they put together a, a net link session. They actually, uh, threw it on Facebook the other day and we're playing Sega Bomberman. Were they playing anything else? Uh, they played a little bit of, uh, of Sega Rally, uh, but the lag was really killing the game. So they switched to Bomberman. Oh, I got you. I got you. Yeah. 1990s tech was pretty, pretty screwed up. We kind of take advantage of the whole instant access like we're doing right now. Um, so, weren't we doing like some competitions this week? I know we had sleep, uh, Steep Slope and all that coming up. Uh, any other competitions going down? Okay, so this week's competition on the Saturn Junkyard Facebook page was the Steep Slope Sliders competition. Um, just to see who could get the fastest time and the biggest trick score on the first course on Steep Slope Sliders, which I believe is Russia, uh, double zero. Um yeah, that was a good that was a good competition. We had a few people doing that. Brian was uh, really mastering the courses and showing everyone how to do it. Uh, I've managed to whittle my time down to under a minute, so I'm pretty pleased about that. But yeah, that was a nice competition and very much in theme with our uh, winter time of year at the moment. So we did winter heat the week before, which is all kinds of winter sports, eleven in all. Uh, but this week it was straight snowboarding with with. Uh, the steep slope sliders challenge and next week we're going to do max tt but we'll talk more about that later on yeah uh both both games or actually all three of those games i'm uh, pretty fond of anyway um in fact we'll probably talk about a couple of them over either this episode or or the next all right well um i think that pretty much covers all the the news and everything in regards to that. Um, so we had a little bit of a treat. We were sitting here thinking for the past couple of weeks, trying to figure out a topic. And, uh, you know, you see all these Biden guides on YouTube all the time. Like you've got metal Jesus rocks. Uh, of course you've got like, uh, John Hancock and all these guys, they kind of throw out stuff introductory. And we figured that we'd go ahead and drop some titles. Now we've actually come up with 21 titles that are all under $200 or 200 pounds. You know, we had to throw pounds in there since, you know, we got a guy from the UK. Uh, they got a nice little advantage of us on exchange rate, but <laughs> we, we kind of threw that Cheater. down. Yeah. Right. Um, we kind of threw that down and everybody got six titles plus one guilty pleasure. <clears throat> That's just kind of the introduction to it at least. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to spend a little bit of time and we're going to throw up some video of each of these games and kind of give you a, a brief discussion and brief little description of what the actual game is, plus the price we found it at. Now, one thing to be note of is that some of the video we're going to show is actually going to be of NTSC and PAL games, well, NTSC U games and PAL games, um, just for convenience for people to actually see what's going on. But a number of these titles are more than likely going to be Japanese, simply because of the fact that the Sega Saturn was so well received in japan it is so e so much easier to actually import titles at a much lower rate especially here in the u.s so with that being said i figured we go ahead and let father k start us off with one of his games okay so uh, the first game i'm going to discuss this evening is fighters mega mix now we were given the challenge by sam to come up with seven games that you could buy for under £200, a lot of the Japanese games uh, can be quite expensive with their imports and so on. 
So we had that budget limit. We thought we weren't going to go for any of the extraordinarily expensive games, which may be some of the better experiences. We'd go for some of the cheaper ones. And when I looked at my list at the end of the seven games, I didn't have a 3D fighter on it. So I quickly did a revision because you need a 3D fighter when you're choosing Saturn games. And the one I thought I would go with is Fighters Mega Mix. Now, the great thing about Fighters Mega Mix is it's a mixture of the two classic 3D fighting games on the Saturn. One being Virtua Fighter, the other being Fighters, uh, sorry, Fighting Vipers. So we get the best of both worlds in Fighters Mega Mix. Uh, we have a select bunch of characters from Virtua Fighter. We have a select bunch of characters from Fighting Vipers. But we also have a number of surprise guests in there. We have uh, a character from Virtua Cop. We have a character uh, called, I think it is, is it Superhero <laughs> or... I, I, I don't remember, but we, we have characters from other fighting games. And one of the craziest things of all is that one of the secret characters you can unlock for this game is the car from Daytona. So you can actually fight as the car from Daytona. Oh, yeah, the, the Hornet? Yeah, yeah, the Hornet, indeed, yeah. the Hornet. And he will, he will taunt you as he's fighting too. Um, but basically, it's if you, if you know Virtua Fighter, if you know uh, Fighting Vipers, these are two 3D fighting games which are different in style and approach. Virtua Fighter has um, traditional looking fighters that fight without weapons or without any sort of objects. In Fighting Vipers, each of the uh, fighters has uh, an, an outfit and an accessory, um, a skateboard, a guitar, it could be roller skates. They, they, It's a little bit unusual. So you've got the two different classic Saturn fighters together in one game and you've got some bonus characters um, the fighting itself is very straightforward you, you're looking at a simple set of button commands and for, one for kick one for punch, uh, one for dodge and then it's just a matter of using your tactics and your timing to take out your enemies you've got modes such as survival you've got the um, chance to go through and unlock different characters it's a fantastic game and it gives you a sample of two classic games from the Saturn Virtua Fighter and Fighting Vipers uh, the great thing about this game for me as well is the price and if you notice when it comes to my picks I came in really under budget here so the first one I'm going to tell you about costs eight pounds which I think is about ten eleven dollars and the packaging, uh, the postage and packaging is only a pound. And that's from our very well-used and well-loved Sex Shop. Now, that's C-E-X. Don't get excited out there, boys. C-E-X. Uh, <laughs> and and <laughs> you can either go into store and buy them. We have lots of, of sex stores all over Britain. Or you can send off. The postage for each game that you buy is a pound. Unfortunately, if you buy three games, you're going to pay three pounds. They don't give you separate postage. But for, for me, I thought for my 3D fighter choice, Fighters Mega Mix was the one coming in at eight pound. Characters from both Virtua Fighter and Fighting Vipers and a few surprise characters thrown in. Great gameplay. As good today as it always was. And your postage is a pound. So uh, that's me done on the first one. Wow. Guys. That's Fighters Mega Mix. Wow, yeah, that I mean, so I see from time to time people post uh, on the Facebook boards um, <clears throat> links to some of the games and accessories and stuff on sale from Sex, and I gotta say, I'm as a you know person over here, way over here in in uh, North America, I'm a little jealous because we don't really have anything that's like a reliable, affordable, uh, you know, game retro game retailer like that. Um, you just kind of, well, I mean, eBay is pretty much the best we got for, and and you can pay, you know, uh, upwards of way too much uh, for any shipping on anything you buy. That's about right. So what you got, Brian? Uh, yeah, so for the first game, I was trying to think about, um, you know, along the lines of RPGs and, 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 
quickly realize that there really aren't very many affordable ones. And so when we're trying to keep, or for the Saturn at least, and so we're, when we're trying to keep this at a total of $200 for all of all the seven games that we're, we're picking here uh, with our budget, um, I figured that, you know, I might have to splurge a little bit to fit an RPG in here. So I went with uh, Mysteria or Mysteria. Um, it also has a couple of other names depending on the region. Um, I think the original title at least in uh, the PAL regions and originally North America was uh, Mystaria, the realms of lore. Um, however, I think they ran into some issues. Uh, I don't know if it was a copyright thing, but they had to change it in North America to Blazing Heroes at some point. And then in Japan, the game was called Riglord Saga. Um, so as far as I know, they're all pretty much the same game, um, but it's pretty extraordinary that you, uh, that you would get... Um, uh, just this, you know, you'd have a different name for every region like this. Usually, you'll have like a couple of different names for a game, but this is, uh, yeah, pretty interesting in that regard. And then also there was a sequel, Riglord Saga Two, but that was only in Japan. And as far as I know, I don't think there's been any uh, fan translations of it, so that's kind of a bummer. Um, but really, what it is, it's it's a uh, grid-based battle, like a strategy RPG, um, and it has, uh, utilizes a grid-based movement and combat system, similar to like Shining Force or, uh, or Fire Emblem and those types of games. Um, now, one of my pet peeves for a lot of games, or really any media in general, is um, I, I really can't stand anything that's generic. Um, anything that doesn't really exude its own charm or character or, or flaws or take any risks. And, and this game, as far as the premise and the story and the characters and all of that's concerned, um, is very painfully generic. I think that's the worst thing I can really uh, say about it. Um, but even in it, even in that, it ends up being a pretty charming little uh, strategy RPG um, because it does have a number of idiosyncrasies. There's like translation issues. There's uh, interesting like lore and and uh, things they throw in there that kind of uh, surprise you a bit um, that, that make it a little more interesting and, and give it some character um, but really its strengths lie in the uh, mechanics of of the gameplay um, there's you're at the outset of the game you're pretty much given free reign of uh, a big portion of the world map uh, from the start and you can um, and, and at the beginning you're a little underpowered so you're you know you're not you can go into different places but you're going to get your ass kicked pretty quickly um but then you can spend some time leveling up and doing uh you know just doing dungeons and and uh, getting your characters uh up to snuff um and it has a little bit of an interesting mechanic where the more you use a type of uh a type of um, action like a attack or defense or magic or uh, I think holy was the other one. Um, you end up gaining more and more attributes or a more uh, actions within those categories. It's it's almost kind of like an Elder Scrolls game in that regard. Um, and then you, um, yeah. So it's it's I don't know. It's it's a fun game. Um, the battles are pretty time consuming. You have to micromanage all six of your characters or whatever it gives you, and you have to move everybody around the grids and uh, you know make sure that you can strategize their movements with their attacks uh, on all the enemies that are on screen and um, it's actually it's a pretty fun game and I, and I really would recommend it overall um, and additionally the uh, the music is is pretty awesome it's like it's mostly orchestrated but um, it's a little more intense and upbeat it's, it kind of reminds me of a 16-bit uh, RPG or like square RPG back in the day um, but yeah yeah it's a uh, it's good times. You know, um, whenever I was sitting here thinking about it, you know, we've talked about it plenty of times. We've actually talked about making videos and, and discussions about it and everything. But for me, if I was going to have to put something on here, it'd have to be a game I really want somebody to play. And uh, the very first game I thought about was Biohazard. Now, for everybody else, that's Resident Evil. But as our buddy Simon over here knows, the biohazard version of this game is extremely cheap in regards to you know import fees everything else and on top of that with the exception of the actual in-game text the game is perfect for an english speaker everything's in english and there's so many walkthroughs and so many other ways to play the game that it's not even an issue whenever it comes down to it so 
for anybody who doesn't know what Resident Evil is, um, it dropped out in 1996 in Japan in March, and it wasn't even a week later, I believe, it was already here in the States on the PS1. Sega Saturn didn't get a release until 1997, and this was, in fact, my very first game I ever got for the Sega Saturn. Now, granted, it, it wasn't the couple of dollars I spent on it for an import. It was, you know, full-blown $50 at the time, but... Basic premises, this is the dawn of survival horror, at least in regards to 3D. Um, you have a mansion, you have numerous puzzles you have to run through, you have item management, you have inventory management, you have to deal with the fact that if you go around shooting everybody, shooting everything that walks around you, you're going to die. Um, you're going to run out of ammo pretty fast. If you keep getting hit, you're going to continuously be using herbs. Um, you also have, you know, the whole aspect of how you save the game. You can't just, you know, go anytime you want to and go save the game. Now, you've got to have ink ribbons. You've got to have all these items to progress through the game. Um, the one thing I really enjoy about it, at least on the Sega Saturn-wise, and why I think so many people should get it, is because of all the extras that come with it. Um, you have the gold tyrant. You have the whole battle game mode. You There are so many aspects of this game that weren't in the original American sony playstation release that it actually distinguishes itself now i'm not gonna lie um it doesn't hold up as well in the long run as the playstation version and that's mainly because of some of the limitations on the actual hardware um not really limitations on the hardware it's just limitations on a bad port you know we've talked about the whole dithering effects and everything else like that there's increased load times but Truth be told, I mean, the game is extremely playable. Um, so long as you have a copy, this works. Unlike Simon, who's been stuck sitting there trying to play with the computer with Jill for the past two weeks. Hopefully you got that fixed up. Um, but, you know, with the exception of that, I mean, the game is all around an immensely fun game. Very much replayability. You've got costumes in it. You've got, you know, infinite rocket launchers. You, you have the ability to play that game multiple times. Multiple endings for every single character. Well, for both characters, excuse me. Um, so, for the $20 that I could get it from eBay in the form of Biohazard, the Japanese release, you know, that's $20 well spent, in my opinion. Yeah, you're going to have to have some way of actually knowing what all the text is saying to you. But, I mean, there are plenty of walkthroughs, plenty of guides. And if you play that game repeatedly over and over, you just about know exactly what it's going to tell you. So, that's kind of my pick. Um... You want to go ahead with your second pick there, Simon? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> um, I noticed when I had looked at the three games from my seven that we were talking about tonight that I'm looking at three Sega games. And my next pick is my classic Sega car game, which is Sega Rally. Uh, this is a game that I got bundled with my Saturn Um and it's a game which I still play to this day. I think I mentioned that in the last podcast. It's got perhaps the best driving game ever made, in my opinion. The physics are superb. It doesn't feel light or floaty. The car doesn't slide. It's a really simple game. That's something perhaps I should have said first. This is a game with four different courses three that you can access immediately one which is unlockable if you beat the other three courses uh, there's a desert stage there's a forest stage there's a mountain stage and there's a lakeside stage uh, which you can unlock so not much in terms of variety in terms of the tracks or courses and not much in terms of variety in terms of the car there is the toyota Celica, uh, there is the lancia stratos and um they, they, the cars themselves uh, and the, the lack of choice and the, the courses themselves and the lack of choice is actually something that feeds into the game because when you've got perfection, you don't need so much variety. With these four courses, you've got different landscapes, you've got different environments to drive over. Uh, the playability of this game is immediate. You can just pick it up. It's not a car game that takes too much time to get used to. The controls are fairly intuitive. I like to play it with a controller. Many people like to play it with the Saturn steering wheel peripheral, which you can get cheaply. Uh, I'm gonna tell you the price of the game in a little while, but then I'm gonna tell you the price of a steering wheel. 
because you can pick up a steering wheel, I think, uh, in sex. So I'm going to mention the sex shop again. You can pick up a, se- a steering wheel from sex for about £8. But the game itself is actually from sex, £2, believe it or not. So for less than a pint of beer, you can get Sega's classic driving game in the UK with £2 for your uh, payment and £1 for your postage. So in terms of bargains, I cannot recommend this enough. I I think it's interesting that a lot of of my favourite Saturn games are sports games, games that have replay value. Uh, If you get to the end of an RPG or if you get to the end of a horror game, sure, you can play it again. You can perhaps try and do things a little differently or shorten the time it took you to do it and so on. But with my uh, sporting choices, you can play these games over and over and over again. So Sega Rally, it's it's a game that uh, begs you to come back and shave seconds off your time. That's that's the main thing. It's amazing fun to play a two-player game uh, and to play that against a friend in your living room is so much fun. It, um, but you can also play it on your own. You can you can just play against the clock, against the ghost car, and try and shave off seconds off your time and and make you make yourself the person who is your inspiration to be it, there's no need to have someone else however and here's the most exciting part we watched on the podcast for uh the sega sorry sega saturn shiro podcast yesterday uh them playing sega rally over the netlink feature so this is one of the first online games you could ever play and thanks to some clever trickery on the computer that I don't understand, people are able to now play this again online. If you go to the uh, Sega Saturn Shiro podcast, you can see some evidence of that, video evidence of that. So as well as being perhaps the cheapest Saturn game out there, it's a game that with the right equipment you can play online these days. So £2 for the price, £1 for the postage. Three cars, four courses, but so much fun. A game you can play over and over again. Uh, And there were five Sega Rally games produced by Sega. I don't think they ever improved on this first one. It really is the pinnacle for me of driving games. Yeah, you you know, uh, and with the price of the steering wheel as well, £8, I don't think you could go wrong with that. So that would be my second choice, Sega Rally. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta second that. That's, a, I mean, it's such an awesome game, um, and one that really rewards you for just, you know, memorizing every every angle and, and turn and just getting them just so, so you can keep your speed throughout the course. Um, I was kind of curious if you knew um, with the online functionality that they've uh, that you know we can uh, with uh, netlink back up um you mentioned earlier that the shiro podcast had a bit of uh issues with the lag on that do you did you get a sense of whether that that was just their own experience with um with their connection or if there was something that or if that might be something that'll be ironed out or won't be a problem uh going down the line for most people well it was it was certainly their opinion that they had seen video of other people using it without any of the issue and I, I I think I recall that one of the guys said they'd used it back in the day or it might have been one of the commenters who said they'd used it back in the day and it wasn't an issue so I'm hoping that the lag um, would not be a feature of everyone's online experience you know even with the, they, they, they stressed the the point that this was a 20 plus year old console that was running an online game and um you know it didn't look unplayable it just made what what was there was i'm gonna say this now very quickly there was a slight difference in the ability of the drivers i'm not saying which driver was better but it was quite difficult to see the two cars on screen at the same time uh so the lag itself it was just you all you would see was the game freezing but i reckon you could still have played it and enjoyed it and for me just the thrill of seeing a saturn online was it, it was a wondrous experience so yeah i don't know if it's i think it's i think it was just a feature for them that that evening i don't think it's something that you would always encounter wow that's 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 awesome though that they were able to get that back up so i guess it sounds like if all else fails uh go ahead and just play somebody who's who's way better or way worse than you and you'll be fine <laughs> just play work, man. Just play work. 
Uh, so what do we got next? Is it? Is it? I believe that would be you there. Oh, okay, that's right. Um, well, so for this next one, um, I'm going to kind of continue this theme that we touched on um, earlier that you guys did with the Japanese versions of these games being uh, a lot cheaper and more attainable uh, than the Western releases. And so for this one, I picked um, Dynamite Deca, which is um, the Japanese version of uh, Die Hard Arcade, which is what we got over here. Um, and it is quite a bit cheaper uh, to be going on eBay and, and picking this up. Um, and as a very arcade-style game, um, there isn't a ton of narrative or anything that you're going to really miss out on. Um, by not understanding Japanese. Um, I think it's English, but I can't, um, or there's some English in there, but I, I can't remember uh, for sure. But but certainly not, um, it's not going to be uh, prohibiting anybody from enjoying the game. Um, and uh, the Japanese version is about $25 as opposed to in the West. I mean, that one's, or at least the North American version's inching upward to you know, probably about $60, $70 now. So, um, so this is probably a good one to get for that uh, reason or that purpose. Um, and then also it's just a really fun game. I'm a huge fan of uh, classic beat-em-ups, um, the Streets of Rage games, and, um, and some of those were just uh, really, really my some of my favorite games um, of all time. Um, and uh, Dynamite Deca uh, follows that, that lineage um, really well. It does, it does great justice to the genre, um, especially if you have a couple of people, if you get, grab a buddy and, and play this multiplayer, uh, it's, it's just a ton of fun. Um, you're, uh, you know, you're, uh, you just go through the levels and there's tons of uh, very brightly colored uh, wardrobed terrorists they, uh, for some reason, they love their their neon. Um, maybe that's a product of the '90s. But um, and, and then you get and you just have like quirky uh, enemies, like sumo wrestlers, robots that have like lasers and stuff. Um, but and you go through the building. It's you know it kind of very loosely uh, similar to the uh, premise of of the original Die Hard game, uh, except for in this case, yeah, you're like coming in via helicopter to the top of the, uh, progressing from the top of the building. You go all the way down to the basement for some reason. And then you go back up to the top for, for the end of the game. And so uh, it just has you going through all these different um, random, you know, rooms and, and parts of the building, which kind of um, actually, you know, the, the visuals and everything are, are uh, really slick for this game. Um, I think the whole premise is that you're saving the president's daughter or something. But but like I said, it's, it's the story is secondary to to enjoying all of that. And it's really um it's just a it's just a great game to go through and and um, beat the crap out of out of people, um, and and then you also get a lot of uh, weird and wacky weapons to do it with. I mean, you got pipes and pistols. At some point, you can you even get like leaf blowers <laughs> that you can uh, uh, fling people towards the wall and stuff. So uh, it, yeah, it's overall I, I really for twenty five dollars right now for the Japanese version, I'd highly recommend uh, picking up Dynamite Deck. Yeah, I mean, dude, I, I I played the hell out of that game. Um, like in the arcades, I played the hell out of that game. Um, in fact, they they even had a arcade cabinet of that probably back in like two thousand and probably last two thousand and seven over at a local uh, movie theater, and that game was ridiculous. I mean, like you said, product of the nineties entirely. Um, but we were talking, y'all were talking about you know replayability. At least Simon was talking about it through sports games and everything, and you know that. There's one specific genre that I absolutely love in regards to replayability. And on the Sega Saturn, you cannot go anywhere without having a shmup. Um, so I figured for this nice little $200 list, I was going to have to pull a, a shmup in. And of course, you know, things like Radiant Silver Gun, Hyper Duel, stuff like that. You're not going to get that in your $200 budget, even importing. It's, it's just not going to happen. So I figured that, you know, I'd try to go for something that had some quality behind it, but also was a little bit unobtainable to the North American and European bunch, at least at a relatively low cost. And uh, I found for $45, you could pick up Darius Gaiden, or Gaiden, or however you want to say it. I've, I've never known how to say that word. But Darius Gaiden, 
for forty five dollars. <throat> and for no one who's uh, anyone who's never played the Darius games or the Darius season se- series of games, Darius Gaiden is it's a um, it is a horizontal shooter. Um, you go across screen left to right. Uh, you've got the power ups. You have multiple stages that you can work off of. Like whenever you come to the end of the level, like most most of them, you can. Well, most Darius games, at least, you can go to the end of the level, beat the boss, and then you have an option to go up or down. Um, the one thing that was weird about Darius is, or at least Darius Gaiden, was that whenever you got to the boss at the end of the level, you know, you generally have an upward path and a lower path. Upward path is the easier path, and the lower path is the harder path, if I'm remembering right. But the thing is, is that, you know... You're, you have a score that you're working on. It's a score-based game. I mean, you're basically just like a, in regards to a sports game, you're just trying to beat your own score, hit the leaderboards, whatever the case is. And for some reason, it actually seems like if you take the easier route, you can make more points. You can get a higher score. That's the craziest thing about it. Um, some of the introductions it brought with it were now you have a black hole bomb. You have a very, you know, you have a number of black hole bombs you can use. And what they basically do is that they will take all the enemies off the screen. They will suck in all the projectiles that are on the screen. But the negative about it is is that if you use that bomb, it also sucks in all the power-ups on screen. And so you really got to, like, you got to figure out when you want to use these things because you can't just drop them all the time. For one, you only have so many. And two, if you drop them, you're going to lose everything on the screen. So the whole point of the game is to continue powering up your ship so that you can get easier and that's kind of the deal with the difficulty up in this the farther along you get up in the level the harder things get the more bullets are coming at you the more ships are coming at you um the cool thing about it was is that it was a beautiful version of you know 2.5 you know granted it's a it's a 2d game it's a 2d shooter and you got crazy little you know fish ships fly fish ships not fish and chips simon um (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but you know that, that they're floating around you know and they got big old tails and they're what but the thing is is that the game is actually almost 3d like i mean i'm pretty sure it uses 3d models in it but you've got that whole aspect of you know you've got the foreground the background and you actually have some depth going on with it it's not just parallax um so for me it was a, a beautiful version of what the saturn was made to do it was like a 2.5 2d shooter and i absolutely loved it um so yeah, that's my number two pick for forty five dollars. <laughs> nice, and uh, I guess if you wanted to cheat a little bit, um, uh, or cheat a lot in this case, you could uh, just snag the uh, Xbox Live Arcade uh, version of uh, Radiant Silver Gun as well for like what was it ten bucks now? Yeah, that's blasphemy, man. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about real satin here today, bro. Yeah, baby. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm going to come in with my last pick now, um, which is another Sega game, and uh, it's another sports game, and it's Sega Worldwide Soccer 98. Uh, Sega Worldwide Soccer is a franchise that there were three uh, versions of. It's um, Sega's, Sega's flagship football game, really. It was initially called International Victory Goal, when it was brought out in Japan and it was about J-League football. But now what they've done is uh, for the Sega Worldwide series, they put international teams in. So they put the teams that you'd find in the World Cup. uh, And they did that for the Sega Worldwide Soccer 97. Sega Worldwide Soccer 98, which is the game I'm going to pick, is essentially the same game as Sega Worldwide Soccer 97. However, what makes it different is the fact that as well as playing as international teams, you're able to play as Premier League teams from the English League, you're able to play as teams from La Liga, and you're able to play as teams from the French League. So you are able to play as club teams. And the uh, great thing about Sega Worldwide Soccer, in contrast to Sega Rally, is that Sega Rally's simplicity is perhaps part of the greatness of it. Whereas uh, in Sega Worldwide Soccer 98, it's the variety you get. You get a huge choice of teams. You get a huge choice of countries to play. And you get a great choice of tournaments. There's a friendly international worldwide cup. There's an international cup tournament, a penalty shootout tournament. Uh, You can play in a club league or you can play a simple club exhibition match. And the gameplay... The simplicity of the gameplay, once again, is superb. 
games uh, easy to pick up. It's not like FIFA, there's not perhaps the nuances and sophistication of button presses and button commands that you'd find in a FIFA, but there are um, all of the essentials that you need to make up a good soccer game. So playability is something that was easy to do back in the day. It sold a bucket load uh, in the UK, I believe it sold pretty well in the US as well, and I think I know Brian's played it. Um, but but this is this is a game um, that once again for me is value for money because it's a game you can play again and again and again. I played it against my son recently. He struggled a little bit because he's he's very much into his FIFA and he found the simplicity of the commands quite difficult. But if you set the game at its hardest. Uh, difficulty setting the computer will give you a good match it's not an unwinnable match you can win against the the CGI uh, opponents but it's it's definitely a, a challenge so if you're playing in a league leagues are quite grueling the leagues go on for a long time you can pay, play 32 games and the shortest time setting you can put on each game is about six minutes so if you're playing uh, in a league or a World Cup, you're going to play a lot of matches, but that's absolutely fine. Um, the music, believe it or not, is actually something which I really appreciate in this game. It's by Sega's uh, one and only Richard Jacks, and he's the guy that does music for many, many Sega games. So even if, you, if you're not familiar with uh, the guy's name, you'll definitely know some of his music. Uh, but... Another factor that makes the game for me is the commentary. Um, they put an English commentator called Gary Blue Sega. I, I don't know how they found him, but they put an English football commentator called Gary Bloom in the game, and he's got a perfect voice for commentating on a match. Uh, he says lots of cheesy cliches, footballing cliches, when different things happen in the game. Uh, and even though they're, they're sound bites, they actually really add to the atmosphere. Uh, they make it real. Um, the names of the players, funnily enough, is another feature which I like about this game. The English Premier League players of the 96, 97, 98 uh, seasons, their names are fairly accurately recorded in the game. Uh, but if you want to contemporize, I think is the right word, your game and, and put the players of the 2017 Premiership in, you can you can edit there's an, a, an edit feature which allows you to edit the name of each of the players in each of your teams so you can have every club team and every international team with the players from 2017 and if you've got a, around about a day or two to sit with your pad programming and them in um but yeah a fantastic game uh, a game which i play over and over it's it's one of those ones that i come back to again and again uh, there's one annoying feature about the game, and I'm going to mention it. They, they, I said that Gary Bloom's commentary was integral to the gameplay experience, which it is. He was commentating very ably on his own in Sega Worldwide Soccer 97, and Sega made the terrible choice of bringing in a co-commentator for Sega Worldwide Soccer 98, who is Jack Charlton, ex-manager of the Republic of Ireland and ex-England player. And his commentary is shockingly bad. So that's my only gripe is that they brought uh, Jack Charlton in to ruin Gary Bloom's commentary in Sega Worldwide Soccer 98. But it's, it's a great franchise. They actually went on to make another uh, Sega Worldwide Soccer 2000 when they, the Dreamcast came out. And that's a fabulous game as well. And if you compare Sega Worldwide Soccer in 1997 to FIFA's 97, it's so much better. It would have been really interesting to see where that would have gone if Sega Worldwide Soccer had had the opportunity to be Sega Worldwide Soccer 2017. It would be so much better than FIFA. So that's my choice for uh, number three this this tonight. Um, that's Sega Worldwide Soccer 98. That's five pound from you know where uh, from the sex shop uh, with, <laughs> with the usual <laughs> with the usual one pound postage. So if you add my three games up for tonight, they come to a grand total of fifteen pound with three pound postage. And when we when we 
get to, to complete these lists in the next podcast, I'll explain why I was able to buy a Sega Saturn at the end of my budget when both of the other guys were only able to buy their seven games. So cheap games are good sometimes, sports games are good. And the ones the ones that I've got, maybe I'm just a miser, I don't know, but I, I was very careful with my budget. £15, three games, you can't beat that. <laughs> God, yeah, God. that's a penny pincher right there, baby. Yeah, um, I will. I mean, I, the other thing I would say about the Worldwide Soccer Series is that um, just even from the very first one that showed up on the Saturn um, to how that see how that evolved between that and uh, you know, 97, 98 versions, um, just technically, you really get a sense that, that the developers were able to um, get a, a much better grasp of the hardware um, and just do a really good job fleshing out a really um, really great atmosphere um, and, and everything and, and just really uh, great attention to detail with the player animations and, and everything going on um, that, you know, it's, it was almost like a completely different game yeah, um, kind of, a couple well, of years into it. I was just going to say, Bram, if I can just add one thing. Visually, it's a beautiful looking game. The only thing that's really changed in soccer games is the um, quality of the graphics. And even though it's a little pixelated, even though it's a little 1996, and even though Saturn owners are always going to gloss over some of the inconsistencies and, and the ugliness of, of Saturn graphics, it's a good-looking game. It really is. It, for its time, it's, it's fabulous. And as you say, the player animations are great. And that's me out. That's me done. Sorry, sorry for chipping in that last bit. Yeah, no, that's that's uh, that's great. Um, so I guess that brings uh, maybe we should even do a, a, a football episode at some point. Um, yeah, I'd like again, that because there's so many. Yeah. Um, so I guess that brings me to my last uh, pick here for at least for this part one of the part two or of the uh, two part uh, episodes in this series, um, and that will be another one that is uh, fairly affordable. This is probably the cheapest one on my list, and that is uh, Manx TT Superbike. Um, this is a unapologetically arcade racer. It was a um, a port of the arcade original that came to the Saturn. Um, fairly pretty faithfully as well it's a it's a really beautiful looking game for for what it tries to do um but you know it's definitely a, another one of those that's a, a product of the 90s uh unmistakably um they just don't make a lot of racing games like this anymore where you have uh two tracks and and that and that's it you get also backward mirror versions or variations of each of them but you you really get two tracks one of them is is an easier one uh and then the other is a more uh, complex configuration um of the tt circuit um and so those are uh just you know it, it really is a game that asks you to focus a lot of your time and just memorizing the the turns and getting used to how the gear shifting works to maintain your speed but also you know be able to stay on the track without ram ramming into the wall. Um, and it also expands a little bit beyond the arcade version where it gives you a few bikes, a different bikes to choose from. Um, I think my favorite ones were like the ones like, I think it was the bright green one where you have slower handling, but your acceleration and, and speed are pretty high. And then you, know, you that kind of each bike has their own attributes that, that vary a little bit, uh, but they definitely feel uh, different depending on what type of control pad you're using. If you're using the digital pad, uh, I generally would go with the slower steering um, bikes. But if you have a, um, uh, in fact, I think my preferred way was the analog stick or the analog controller. Um, but also the steering wheel uh, works pretty well for this too, as blasphemous as it may be to be controlling motor, uh, you know, motorbikes with a uh, with a steering wheel. Um, and, and just the tracks themselves have a lot of uh, neat detail as well. And there's uh, different um, unique areas you're going through uh, for like the oceanside cliff areas. You got uh, lighthouses and beachside towns and you got your cobblestone winding roadways and forest areas um, and your obligatory English churches um, dotting the landscape. So uh, it's, yeah, it's really a, a beautiful uh, game. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I would highly recommend it. And actually, I had a quick question uh, for you, Simon. Um, I know you're you're in Manchester, 
And I think there's actually a ferry that goes between uh, the Isle of Man, which is the uh, the location of Manx TT, um, and uh, and Liverpool. Um, have you ever gone out there? I haven't, but I have two very close friends who used to work on that exact ferry um, and used to obviously live in the Isle of Man. My, in fact, my friend's parents have a guest house in the Isle of Man. The one weekend I was due to go, I something happened and I, I couldn't get there. But it's not that far away. It's probably about 200 miles away from where I am right now. If that, maybe less. Um, uh, no, but I've never been. And it is a place where I believe when Sega did their uh, rendering of the, the, the countryside, they, they've done it fairly accurately. So what you see in Max TT, you could see if you were going around the Max TT course. It's... Uh, the Max TT, can I just stress this as well, is a, a bike competitor, a motorbike race that is held every year on the Isle of Man. I'm saying this because on the Metal Jesus review of Max TT, they rave about what a great game it is and then say, I don't know what this Max thing is. What is this Max? It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's a place. It's, it's the Isle of Man. It's a... a it's one of the places with the oldest parliament in the world. I'll, I'll, there's a little factoid for for everyone. You can edit that one out if you want, Sam. <laughs> no, we're going to let this stay. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, it's a great game. It's one that I've played. Coming back to the Saturn, as I have in 2017, Max TT is one of the games that's really blown me away. And even though Brian recommends using the steering wheel, he admits it's a little blasphemous and I can't get my head around. I've, I've had to use the control. I can't use that steering wheel bracket. Well, yeah, you know, you know, with all the, the sports titles y'all are throwing out there, uh, you know, between Sega worldwide soccer, Mike's TT, Sega rally, um, you know, I figured I'd have to be in line with Simon on this one. And I got to throw down another fighting game. Um, In fact, I have two fighting games on my list, but I'm just going to talk about the 3D fighter right now. You know, uh, the Dead or Alive series was non-existent in my mind until about 1998, whenever I managed to pick up Dead or Alive. Now, this is a little sacrilege here, but I picked it up on the PS1. Um... I think it was 1988, 1998, whenever I picked it up. But I picked it up on the PlayStation 1 to begin with. Um, now, I will say this. The PlayStation 1 version does not hold up near as well as the Sega Saturn. Um, the Sega Saturn, you can pick it up in Japan only on the Sega Saturn. It didn't release in the States. Um, but you can pick it up for $20, okay? Now, granted, you don't have, you know... You don't have breast animations. You don't have breast physics or any of the rest of this stuff from Dead or Alive 2 or 3 or any of the rest of them. But uh, what you do have is you have the awesome counter system. You have the blocking system. You have massive move combinations. I mean, it will take you so long to remember every aspect of this game. And I actually, um, specifically Dead or Alive 2 and Dead or Alive 3, I used to play competitions with them. We'd go out to Dallas and we'd go out to conventions and, you know, there was always some little group of people that had DOA playing competitions. And for me, going back to the very first one, um, poor graphics as it is, you know, it's, it's beautiful because all the foundations were there. Uh, not to mention, I mean, you have... For the time, you have a large number of characters to pick from. You also have the entire ring dynamic. So just like with Soul Calibur and another, oh, and a number of other fighters, you know, you have a ring out effectively. Now, granted, it's not a ring out in Dead or Alive. What it is is you kick somebody out and it goes into a damage area. And it's not to the grand scheme of multiple layers like, you know, DOA 2. But for what it was at the time, it was absolutely amazing. Um, because you had this dynamic to where not only did you have countering, not only did you have your combinations, you have your blocking, but you also had to keep in mind your position on the actual field. Because if you got yourself backed into a corner and you couldn't, you know, pull yourself out of it, you could take, you know, 10% of your damage like that if you got kicked out of the area. Um, not to mention a little explosion fire effect thing was, was absolutely awesome for a kid. Um. So, you know, for twenty dollars, 
for a Japanese exclusive on the Sega Saturn, you know, and that was with spine card for all you collectors. That was complete. That was shipped all of it, twenty dollars to my front door. That's a beautiful thing, in my opinion. I mean, because with the exception of things like Virtual Fighter Two and Virtual Fighter Remix, to an extent, Fighters Mega Mix, um, and on the the huge scores of two D fighters. I mean, DLA is one of those three D fighters that you, if you're fighting aficionado on the Sega Saturn, in my opinion, you have to get that game. And for twenty dollars, I couldn't pass it up. I agree, and can I also say some that? I actually think it's a beautiful game. I played it last night, um, and the first battle that I was playing, I think, was against a sunset. And visually, Dead or Alive has always been a good looking game. I didn't know about it till the Dreamcast. So when I bought my Japanese import copy for the Saturn, it was a revelation. I've never, I didn't, I wasn't even aware. I only knew because it was called Dead or Alive Two that there must have been one before. And when I found out there was a Saturn version, I had to get it. Uh, it's a good looking game. One one other thing though, there is a, a breast jiggle feature on it, so I'm not proud of knowing that, and I've never taken advantage of of that option. But there is actually a breast jiggle option in the options, apparently. <clears throat> apparently. Well, um, you know, I, I I never found that Simon, so you must have been <laughs> really digging for it, baby. <laughs> yeah, no, it's there. I, as I say, I never took advantage of that, but it's there. Yeah, and it seems like uh, Tecmo as a developer, um, you know, regardless of the hardware that they would work on for these games, whether it's the Dead or Alive series, the Ninja Gaiden games, uh, or, or what have you, I mean, they tend to really push the limits of, of most of the hardware that they uh, commit to on these projects. They always seem to go uh, all out and, and make some of the best looking games on whatever platform they're developing for. So that's that's a another uh, aspect of that that I felt was pretty uh, interesting and indicative of this game as, as it pertains to the uh, rest of their library. Oh, by, by no, by no means is it a bad looking game. Um, time has, time has taken its toll on it, but the main thing is, is that if you compare it to the PlayStation one uh, port, it, it is significantly better, just like what Simon was talking about with the sunrise effect, with your background effects, with the character models. Everything looks so much smoother and so much so much more crisp in regards to the 3D elements of the game, especially whenever you consider the fact that most people, even to this day, still believe, and you know to a certain extent correctly, that the PlayStation 3, I mean PlayStation 1, excuse me, was the better 3d console and you know this is what we were talking about in a past episode the, the for the one in 100 programmers who could actually program for the sega saturn they could make it do amazing things and completely blow it out the water you know and i made the i made a joke the other day or not a joke i, I miss misspoke when uh, i think it was uh you and me were talking the other day brian i called the system a 60 a 64-bit system and while it does have two 32-bit processors it's still a 32-bit system but maybe that was me subliminally trying to echo the idea in the back of my head that it really should have been a 64 system because of some of the things that some of the programmers actually got it to do yeah or maybe you're just buying into atari's kool-aid do the math just hey, baby, add, I can do up. the math, man. I'm simplistic <laughs> like that. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's, I, I'm sure we'll be talking uh, quite a bit about the leaps and bounds that some of these developers went through um, to really milk the Saturn for all it could do and put it through its paces. Um, and, and the PlayStation really just, I think, you know, they had the benefit of, of time, really. I mean, just having that life cycle uh, for that, you know, that five six seven year life cycle where you had um uh, developers really pushing you know getting uh, a ton out of like rpgs and, and other genres uh namco is another one that always made really nice looking games that kind of went neck and neck with what tecmo was doing um and so i uh, yeah i mean I, I feel like if the saturn had been uh just had the chance to to have a, a full healthy long life um you would have seen more and more um uh, developers able to take advantage of it uh, by the end of that. So guys, I think that'll be a good stopping point on this part one of the part two of the building a budget library for the Sega Saturn in 2017. 
uh, for all of our listeners, all the audience out there, we deeply appreciate every one of y'all making the time to actually sit down and listen to us. Uh, hopefully we will see y'all around for part two. Don't forget that if you're listening to this on the podcast form, that we will also have a more condensed YouTube video format that we will put out in a part one and a part two. You can catch that over at our YouTube channel, or you can also look us up on Facebook at the Saturn Junkyard. And there is also the possibility of you coming over and looking at the blog. You know, the blog's got a lot of good articles over there. We've got articles from all the way back in 2006 when we first got started. So one thing that I do want to mention before we finally cut all the way out is we have a new member, um, Nuno. Some of y'all are probably going to already hear him in his introduction podcast, episode 1.5. If you haven't caught that episode, go ahead and check it out. If you also want to see some of what Nuno's doing for the uh, Sega Saturn crew, he's already dropped two videos out. Y'all are more than welcome to go over to the YouTube channel and give them some love, give them some comments, or check them out on Blogspot and give them a little bit of uh, helpful insight or feedback, rather, on some of his articles. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is the Sega Saturn Titan Cast signing off. Cheers. See ya. See ya. See ya.